guys. Welcome back to Deconstructing Damsels. I am your host, Jessica Hannon. I'm remembering this finally. And today's episode is going to feature the amazing spoiler alert by Olivia Dade. I have guest Fiona West, who is an author. And actually, if you paid attention to the last episode, you will know that Kristen and I went over Fiona's work more than we bargained for. And unintentionally, this apparently became Fiona West month, so who knew? But I wanted to say, you know, it's been a blast putting this together. And just before, I'm going to do some housekeeping, as always. I'm going to try to keep it kind of quick because it's kind of a long episode. And I know you guys have things you have to do, too. But I have got some amazing happiness on this episode. And that is because... More people have told me they're listening to the podcast, and this is, like, it's something that I constantly worry about, and I constantly think about, and I'm like, oh, am I doing things right? Can they understand me with my list for now? Because my teeth are kind of jacked now, and unfortunately, it's just, it's, it is what it is, and I don't have, like, the billion dollars to fix it, so I kind of have to go with what I've got. But I'm really glad you guys are listening, and you're okay with it, and you like what I say, and... You guys have no idea what that means to me, like truly, because sometimes I wonder if I'm doing things right. And starting season three for this year has been really cool because the third anniversary will be coming up soon for the podcast in May. And I don't know what to do about that yet. So if you have suggestions, please let me know. You know, you can I have everywhere to get in contact with me. you. You know, Damsel's podcast is Everywhere that you can possibly think of, I'm there. You know, I'm even got like damselspodcast at gmail.com. I seriously want to hear what you guys want to do for the anniversary in May because I want to start kind of getting stuff together now because life is difficult and, you know, we have what we have. But finding out that you guys are listening and you're tuned in and, guys, seriously, my heart is so happy that I, I can't express it when you guys say stuff like that. Like, I sometimes wonder if I'm talking into the void because my opinions are very different from sometimes in other parts of the romance, you know, reviewing community and book community. And so I don't always know if you guys care and not and that's not to say that, you know, like anything against either one of us. It's just that, like, I don't know if what I have to say is has value sometimes. So it's totally cool that you guys are listening. And I promise I'm going to try and go onto more podcasts. I have two that will be coming up in the next couple weeks or have already dropped i was on boobies and newbies and we listened to well read uh party favors by aaron mcclellan i think is how you say your name and it was a blast oh my god i had so much fun and we just we talk about things that are other <laughs> than the book too i went on my little like and America's Next Top Model thing because it's been quarantine times and apparently that's like what everybody watches. But I've, I've really been enjoying it. And I've been watching it on the Damsels account on YouTube as well. <laughs> so it kind of like goes between book and America's Next Top Model. But I kind of think sometimes they, get, they go together. So I'm definitely going to put that out there. Please, if you guys get a chance, please, please, please listen to that because... It was a ball. Like, I had so much fun. Kelly is amazing. If you guys can get on the podcast, that would be even better. Because, seriously, like, the books she picks are always fun, and they're different, and they've got just this joy in them a lot of times. And, you know, that's kind of what I want to talk about. I like to be happy on this podcast. I don't like to rant. I promise. I know I rant sometimes, but I try not to. It is my deepest wish not to rant. And there is some more stuff. So... I mentioned the Challenging Damsels uh, podcast on, well, the challenge on the last episode, which was the one for more than we bargained for. And to add to that, I have a bunch of links on the damselspodcast.com website. And I want to let you guys know because I keep adding resources as I find them. So that way there's always something to kind of find for the prompts. There's also the Facebook group and it's really easy to find. It's literally challenging damsels just like the prompt challenge. And I did that on purpose because I don't really don't want a Facebook group, but I wanted that because there are so many things we can find as readers and talk about. And I think that's like really important to find those extra resources. It's a, it's a group you have to join. You can't just, like, you know, follow it. But as long as you're, like, you know, 
not someone that's anti my podcast and anti what I read and you know guys know what I read, then you're fine. Just, you know, follow the rules, read it, answer the one question. There's two whole questions, answer them and we're golden. I'm mentioning that because, you know, I mentioned a little bit on the Boobies and Newbies podcast, so I thought I'd, you know, extend it out a little bit. But I'm also going to be on All the Good Dogs. And on that podcast, I talk about the brilliant Penny, you know, the best dog ever. I don't care what anybody says. This dog is amazing. She's right now sleeping curled up as my husband takes a nap. But I wanted to talk about her. And, oh, my God, you guys can learn so much things that I maybe haven't always said about her. And you can learn, like, how I'm feeding her now because it's a whole new routine that's kind of interesting. So that should drop sometime in February. And, you know, like I said, I'm trying to be on more podcasts. So if you want to contact me about being on the podcast, you have one, let me know because <laughs> I'm down with it. I love it. I never shut up. Why would I stop talking now? So <laughs> on to the next part of the housekeeping. I have got some books to open up on YouTube. I'm going to have a video. I'm going to stream it. And I'm putting it on there because I think it's easier because it's a visual medium and it's easier to kind of put stuff in. But I am opening some paranormal romances on that. I have already recorded it. Shh. <laughs> I'm going to put it out in the next couple of days, probably sometime about a week after this releases. So that way there's something in between. And it's going to be fun because I love paranormal romances. I don't talk about them on here a lot. Usually I end up with historicals because that's my other safe space. But paranormals I've got a love and it's deeply attached to me. And if I want you guys to, <laughs> to watch that because it's about half an hour or so. And I think you're going to have fun. Because you get to see how I react to books that I didn't pick out. Like, they just came in a big box. Because here in Germany, we don't you we don't have, like, the thrift stores that, that we have at home in the U.S. So, I can't just go get, like, a, you know, 50-cent book. I can't go, like, haul, like, 20 bucks for, like, five or six bucks, you know? So, it, it's a whole thing. And so, I really enjoy that. And... It was fun seeing my reaction because I'd actually kind of forgotten it because I bought them, I bought it like months, like not months, but probably like three weeks before I opened it. And so it was really fun to kind of remember what I found. And you'll see some, I have some of my favorites unintentionally in there and some intentionally and it's just, it's a blast. So definitely watch out for that on YouTube. And I'm going to be putting all the, rev all the paranormal books that I have in that box. The reviews are only going to go on YouTube. So if you want to see me review them or hear about them, you will have to check out YouTube. Now, <laughs> on to the normal. So I want to say thank you so much to my patrons, Marlene, Carrie, Kelly, <laughs> and the Elm sisters. I want to thank you all so very much because, because of your support, I was able to buy those books because like, Normally, a book here is almost $4 counting shipping. That's for a single book. But if you can get these big packets of things, you can usually get them for, like, maybe $16. And you get, like, 20 books. So even if you don't like the books, sometimes you'll keep the books. But there was a whole, like, it's a whole thing. And so it means a lot when I can find these kind of books and these kind of boxes. And I'm constantly looking for them. Only my unboxings will probably be on there, except for maybe one. One I may actually put on, on Instagram Live because of that. Um, mentioned before my Jack Tees. <laughs> so because of my Jack Tees, you will find that I have a mask on. That's just vanity riding supreme, and it is what it is. <laughs> so just fair warning. I hope you guys enjoy it, and I will start this podcast. You will hear a few really cool promos for different podcasts along in this episode because I have kind of want to bring those back. I, I mean, my listeners have got a wide variety of interest and I want to kind of promote ones that I think help and kind of connect with this brand. So I have got Bex Goose, <laughs> uh, Potato Lady Reviews, and... We'll see how that goes. And I've also <laughs> Sword and Silk books. And that has got Lainey B. And I want to go ahead and let you know they're coming. So when you hear them, you're not like a little bit, what? 
when did this happen again? It's been a while since I did it, but again, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to make the community. <laughs> like that's the whole point is to make a community when you build, when you build a podcast, right? I hope you guys have fun and enjoy Fiona and I talking about one of my favorite books of 2020. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Then you don't need crackers. Yeah. Speaking of food and such, uh, that was a big theme in the book. Was yes, and I loved her for it. Oh yes, I thought the representation was awesome with April. I I was so happy when I finished reading this book. I was just like reading it aloud to to Mister Editor the whole time. Yeah. I mean, there were so many great lines and. One of the other things I really appreciated about the book was that April was a real professional and Mm. it was obvious that she'd done research. Like it was in her gift giving. It was in the way she described her analogy about her relationship with her mom. Like Mm. it was, it was like deep into the psyche of the book. And I love that. Like I love when we're seeing women who are really capable at what they do and really invested in what they do, like as a job. Yes. Uh, Because sometimes I pick up a romance and I think, like, the only thing this heroine loves is the hero. And I guess there's nothing wrong. Yeah. It's like, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. But most of us have fandoms, right? Like, we have other stuff that we love. And this was, like, the perfect book for thinking about, like, how, like, why do women have fandoms? Like, not why, we're people. But, like, how has it been portrayed in the past and, like, why is it controversial for us to have fandoms? Yes. Like, that's the, exactly. that's the thing that brought out to me was, like, well, of course she has a fandom, you know? But it but there is that very real fear of, like, are people going to think I'm immature? Are people going to think I'm childish? You know, that this is some sort of, you know, unworthy pastime for me to have. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I loved the way she portrayed that that fear, but also lifted up the fact that, yeah, She's got things she loves. She's got a job she loves. She's got uh, a fandom. She's got all these good things in her life. Besides the hero. Like, her life is already very full. Yes. Like, he's the cherry on top, but he's not the whole Sunday. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. When they, when they have so many different facets to them. And that's actually why I like Olivia Day's writing in general. Because her heroines are often fulfilled outside of the relationship they're in they have goals they have ideas they know what they want you know like she talks about so the first book i ever read by her was called may day and it was one Uh of the um romancing the librarians Uh and you know it's not in print right now and she said it probably won't be for quite a while because she'd have to rewrite things that she really wasn't happy with and and i know the one she's talking the bit she's talking about but the one thing i liked in that was the heroine was older a virgin Mm -hmm. not because like it was like a purity thing or anything it was just i'm not ready for it so why am i going to do it like why am i going to put that much pressure on myself yeah which actually reminded me a little bit of (laughs) i used to watch a lot of reality tv that was on vh1 Uh uh-huh and i used to watch love and hip-hop atlanta Uh and um one of the ones tokyo uh she was on there and tokyo would talk about how you know her virginity was something that was important to her. It had nothing to do with anything outside of society. It's, she didn't feel ready for that responsibility. Yeah. And I appreciated the fact that, like, Day did that in May Day. Mm-hmm. And I feel like she also did it in here, not with the not with the virginity part, but with the the knowledge of knowing what she could handle when she could handle it. Like, because mm-hmm. there's a lot of emotional things that come with, with sex if you're in yeah. a relationship. Yeah. Like, if you're moving towards something is going to happen that way. Yeah. And even though, you know, April and Marcus had sex, like the third or fourth date, Mm -hmm. it wasn't a big deal because she was ready for it. Yeah. And so was he obviously, but like she was especially ready for it. And I think that's really important. Well, and I loved the way that she portrayed, like she did not skirt around her size when she yes. was writing the sex scenes. And that to yes. me meant so much. Like, Same. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it really did. Because I remember when Penny Reed came out with all of her um, Smarty Pants romance books. 
Yeah. She had one called Weight Expectations that had a fat heroine, and I was like, okay, good, here we go. Like, let's, I know Penny, I know, like, what she writes, and it was written by, uh, it was written by Emmy Carter, but it was in the same, like, vein as everything else. And I remember, it's like maybe three quarters of the way through the book, they've been leading, 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 and for the sex scene, it faded to black. And I just sat there so, feeling so betrayed, honestly, that, like, I, like, it's not that a book has to have a steamy scene, but when all the other books do, and that's the only one that doesn't, mm. the disappointment was just heartbreaking. And and so I loved to see April being able to express herself, do what she was ready for, be flirty and fun with, with Marcus, and have him appreciate everything about her body, you know? Yes. And that... Yeah, it just, it meant a lot. And I, exactly, I mean, no, I get it. Like, I've been saying that the, for the past couple of days, like, you feel seen in those moments. Yeah. You understand exactly what's going on in those moments. And, like, yeah. you know, I'm fat. Like, I am open about it. I don't care what anybody thinks about it. Like, yeah. if I lose weight, it's because I feel like I should have to. I don't give a crap what my doctors say. I don't care what anybody says because yep. – as I've gotten older, I've gotten more comfortable in it because I'm going to be 40 in 2021. Yeah. So I'm, I'm unwilling to give anyone else that time. Like yeah. I've been confident for a while, but like the, the older I get, the more definitive I am in that confidence. And that's why I liked April because I was like that exactly that. Like yeah. you can be hot as hell and no matter what size you are, yeah. But you can also be hot as hell and be fat, which is not portrayed on TV or media ever. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's so rare. Yeah. And it's like this big secret of, you know, everyone wants to be thin. And it's like, uh-uh. When I was yeah. thin, I was sick and almost dying. I don't want to be thin again. Well, yeah. And there's so many ways to be healthy, right? That was mm -hmm. one of the things that I thought was interesting in the book was how April just really rejected exercise because people had always pushed it on her. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a sore spot for her, but I was out this morning on a run thinking, but fat women do exercise. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, I exercise, I'm fat, <laughs> you know? It's, yeah. And so it was, I was thinking, you know, I would love to get to a place where we can show fat heroines who are, who are sexy and who exercise and who eat well, but are fat nonetheless, because I mm -hmm. think a lot of us have chronic illnesses We've got other things going on that are contributing to the shape of our bodies that don't really have anything to do with what our bodies can do. And that's, yes. that's, that's what I've come to in the last few years is like, I want to think about what my body does for me because my heart keeps beating, you know, and, and my body is doing all these good things for me apart from what it looks like, apart from its shape um, yep. and just appreciating what a good gift that is in my life and to have, you know, two hands and two feet that work is a huge thing. <laughs> Ask somebody who doesn't, it's a huge thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a, an organization called beauty redefined that I discovered when I was writing. Um, I was writing a character who had body dysmorphia and uh, for my fantasy series and I found them and they, they talk a lot about, you know, do you love your body because it looks good or do you love it because you know it is good? But like mm -hmm. apart from how it looks. Uh, and I felt like April really had a good handle on that. Like she, she loved her body. She was comfortable in it. Um, the only thing that I wondered about was in the sense that it was obvious that she had trauma around her body mm -hmm. and it was obvious that she was looking through that lens when Marcus first says, hey, do you want to come work out with me? Mm. And um, she never really apologizes for kind of jumping to conclusions about what he meant instead of, like, she she thinks she's giving him another chance, but she's not, she's not coming out and saying why right. it hurt her, right? She's not coming out and saying, so you think I need to exercise, you know, or... Um, yeah. Or something like that. And that's what's hard sometimes is it, it's hard to write characters who are in their mid-30s who still have those kind of mis misunderstandings. I feel like sometimes I'm like, wait a minute, though. I, I'm in my mid-30s. I would just say, 
do you think I need to exercise? Like, are you trying to say something? You know, I think I would, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just too confident. Um, but I wanted her to say something small, even if it's just, oh, working out's not my favorite, or I'd rather just get breakfast, or trying to salvage it instead of that kind of sweeping out of the ballroom in a fit of peak feeling. It sort of didn't jive with how old she was for me. But I don't know. I I think I can understand it, though, because there was a time, like, again, I'm going to be 40, but, like, in my early 30s, I can remember being... Um, being like that, being sensitive and not being mm-hmm. able to explain it. Yeah. Because I didn't always have the vocabulary to explain it to someone that hadn't gone th- through it. Hmm. Um, because like, I've always been fat. Like I've, yeah. I've been fat basically since I was like, you know, 12, 13, when my boobs started growing, so did the rest of me. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I can understand where she's coming from in that way yeah. because I, I probably would have done the same thing because I think it also relates not so much to the trauma of that as the trauma that her mother yeah. gave her because every time mm-hmm. she would she would say something to her mother it would be flipped around to make her mother almost a victim. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's it's like you've got the the fat shaming that comes from you know the world. Yeah. And then you have the fat shaming from a per- personal level and you don't always know how to untangle that trauma yeah well and i think it made sense especially since she didn't really know marcus as well as she knew some of the other well and you're right too like she doesn't owe him that emotional (sighs) bank account if that makes sense like you know it takes emotional energy to explain things like that to people Mm -hmm. and and you're right since she doesn't know him very well maybe she just didn't want to invest in that you know she didn't want to take the emotional energy to explain it to him I I, well, I, mean, I I can see that. And, and especially, like, when you think about it at the time, she had, like, this was, like, right, like, what, maybe, like, three or four weeks after they'd had that Twitter exchange. Mm-hmm. So, um, thereabouts. So, it was, like, I could see where she would be, like, emotionally uh, unwilling to compromise in that way. Because yep. there there's no way that you would think that, like, if you're average and – you know, average being someone not with a lot of power, Mm -hmm. if you have average power in your day-to-day life, then you're not going to be able to necessarily easily believe that someone really famous, really handsome, really, you know, with all these things that their hands and their fingertips is going to not think that because, I mean, that's what their, that's what his business has told her her entire Mm -hmm. life. Yeah. And I mean, you know, like, and like she pointed out with uh, Lavinia, like, she was supposed to be ugly in the books. Like, that that was her whole thing was, and not ugly as a, you know, negative, just ugly by society standards. Right. And, you know, they changed that to make her pretty. Right. Because they couldn't sell ugly. Right. So I, I think it was easier for me to understand that considering the entertainment industry that he was – you know, portraying at the time because it's also been playing. He'd been playing up that being a dumb, dumb bimbo. Mm-hmm. You know, like like literally like the like the Anna Nicole Smith version almost of a yeah. person. <laughs> and so he was playing into it. So yeah. she had seen a lot of him, but she hadn't seen enough to be able to trust him that much yet. Yeah, but we do see her lay out that effort with her friends on the Lavinia server. Oh yeah, and I loved that scene. And I, I mean, it was long, like her, her, her speech to them was long. And, uh, but I was like, you know what, everything she says needed to be said. And she said it in a gracious, but firm way. And I just thought, wow, that's, that's an example for us, right? That if there's somebody you care about, and it's something that means something to you, there is a way sometimes to set a boundary and say, this is what I need it going forward. Yep. Like this is this is what will feel like respect to me going forward. And I also noticed like with that, it's um have you seen Olivia Dade's um uh talk about writing fat characters? On the Frankfurt panel? Uh yeah, there was she was on there and she's also got one on uh YouTube. Yes. Um I, I think it's it's the same one, but it's like, you know, two different ones. Yeah. Um and she's talking about it and I 
appreciated the fact that some of those points were in this the speech yeah because it was a it's literally a direct conversation with her audience and with her fellow colleagues and you know professionals in the industry and i appreciated that yeah and it was done in a way that was inclusive and not necessarily a lecture Yes, exactly. It wasn't a lecture. It was very much focused on her and her reaction and the way it felt to her when they would when they would write things like that. And I mean, it it wasn't really accusatory. Right. It, she still yep. as- assumed that they were good hearted, assumed that they did not intend to injure her. Um, and I thought that was very mature and, and awesome. But yeah, it was such a great example of how we can stand up for ourselves while assuming the best about other people. Yes. And how to to take that confidence that you're building in yourself, because she was already confident. Yeah. But it was a different kind of confidence. It was a confidence in her in her worth. Yeah. Something that had been like sawed away and, you know, chipped away by her parents her entire life. Yeah. And it and like as someone who's been told many times in her life, you would be so pretty if you lost weight. <laughs> Bitch, I'm already pretty. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Ask my husband. I'm the most gorgeous person on the planet to him. Yep. Like, like, I can look like the, me- like, I cannot bathe for three days. He still thinks I'm gorgeous. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's one of those things of, you have to feel what other people are feeling. And yeah. sometimes that can, you know, be a boomerang and just take a lot out of you. And I was really proud of April for standing up and saying, enough. Yeah. Like, yeah. it may not bother, you know, this person, this person, this person, but it's bothering me. Yeah. And I felt like, I wasn't sure, but it felt like the server was more like a Discord conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, more Discord, less like, you know, um, a bulletin board or anything like that. And yeah. so it, I think it was a very, a very interesting way of doing, like, the epistolary style Mm -hmm. yep because because of the random breaks and stuff like that like you can see like the character limit type breaks on there well and i think i appreciated that yeah i did too and it helped me stay connected to marcus when i was really mad at him for lying to her yeah like it, it that that is what i started to struggle with about halfway through the book is i'm like i'm bonding with her now and i almost feel like i'm betraying her like because I'm rooting for them, and I think he's a good guy, but he is yeah. lying to her. And I, kn- I, it's like the car crash you can see coming, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, so this is not going to be a book where there's no, you know, dark moment. Um, but it was like, wow, it, it really, it helped me stay connected to him and see yeah. why he is doing this and see, you know what was there beforehand because so much of it is based on their previous relationship for him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but that, and and yeah, the, like the, the eight months, the two months, all that, all that kind of stuff really helped. Yeah. It it did. That they referenced, but it actually filled in the gaps. Yeah. I mean, even the, um, the scripts at the end of each like chapter when they would show up. Yeah. Also, (laughs) again, it explained, some things, just like the yeah. fan fiction did and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it, it was it, a really fun addition to the book. I loved it. Yeah. Like, normally I don't like that. I, I don't like, I don't like it sometimes because I feel like it's a gimmick. Mm-hmm. But in here it actually felt relevant because it was literally a love letter to fandom. And fandom is, a, it's not entirely online because some people are not online. Yeah. But the, the fandom she was describing was an online fandom. Yeah. And it was very obvious, yeah. you know, like it, it was very obvious. Like when they would talk about, even before they showed the, before they said AO3, I was like, oh no, she's on archive. Yeah. I know this one. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> because like I, I was getting out of fan fiction when archive opened. So mm-hmm. when AO3 was kind of catching on, I was leaving. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have some of my fan fictions up there and I still get kudos and stuff randomly. And I'm very confused some days. Yeah. But I'm like, <laughs> how are you? But okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, whatever makes you people happy. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was very interesting because when you look at it and you see how layered the experience is, you can see where 
Olivia is writing about romance community too. Mm-hmm. Like you, it's very obvious when you talk about all the different stuff because if you follow, like if you follow twenty five romance readers on Twitter mm-hmm. or writers, you will see them interact these ways outside of Twitter. Like they're not on Twitter, obviously, but yeah. it's you can see when they talk about like they talk, you know, the authors will talk about fan fiction or they'll talk about like you know, well we went to this con, we did that. Like you can see their yeah. interactions and how they are outside of the the community they're like a small fandom and so it was a very interesting layer to the fandom and the the communication to it as well yeah yeah i mean it was definitely specific to that fandom uh and specific to romance and it was Mm -hmm. it was fun to hear how Marcus was, like, not so sure about the steamy stuff, and his stuff was all melancholy, you know, but a man who <laughs> yeah. writes romance? Hello! Where's my glass of water? That's hot! <laughs> right? And, like, and it can add layers to it, like, and that's that's not to just the guys that are writing romance, it's actually just that, you know, a lot of guys in the publishing industry don't like writing romance because they yeah. think it's, like, fluff. Right. It was, like, are you fluffy every day in your life with your wife or is there conflict and is there resolution? Well, and the beautiful like, thing about romance is because we know we're going to get that HEA, we can have confidence that the hard things that everyone's going through in the books is going to come out okay. Mm-hmm. And I actually think that opens us up to be able to talk more about trauma and body issues and all the difficult things that people go through in life because... We know how it's going to end, right? We know it's not going to end on a downer and leave us depressed. But we can see people working through these things. We can see them coming to different conclusions and growing and changing in in painful ways that still resolve in a happy way. So I think romance is one of the best places to talk about harder things in society. (laughs) Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think that that's... I was actually talking about this on Twitter today. So I started reading romance when I was little. Mm -hmm. I mean, my godmother used to have the zebra, like, hologram, you know, romances, (laughs) like, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, I was reading those. And Danielle Steele, who is not romance, I don't care what anybody says, because everybody dies, just like Nicholas Sparks. Yeah. But anyway. (laughs) But I was reading those kind of books when I was little, and then I got out of it. I was reading, like, Sweet Valley High around the same time, but I was reading that, and then I kind of, like... I would read, but I would be reading things, you know, like Ann Bishop's, like, Dark Jewels trilogy and Mm -hmm. stuff like that, which is much, much different than romance. Mm -hmm. And so I would read all that. And then around 2002, 2003, maybe around four, I was introduced to Joe Beverly by someone on LiveJournal. Okay. That's a callback. Yeah. And so, <laughs> but, and, and I loved her. And I was like, oh, this is romance. Yeah. You know, this is romance now. And so I, I fell back into reading it. And, you know, there's so many problematic things in those books that mm-hmm. I didn't realize necessarily at the time, but I realize it now. Yeah. And, but the really interesting thing was, was you can see how things have evolved. Mm-hmm. And and how people are writing, but also how we're communicating. Yeah, like we as in me as like as in a reviewer and a, and a you know a fan and a, you know as you know a person in the deeply committed to like making making it a better place for everybody. Mm-hmm. I'm not like <laughs> like I'm not like one of the the big people but like i i do my part when i can here yeah and i think that like olivia and and marcus were doing the same thing when they were helping create the server yeah you know they were like okay we don't like what's happening here so we need to find what's happening here yeah and around the time that i was reading romance i was also learning how to write i was writing fan fiction i've been writing fan fiction for a little while before like a couple years before but um i was reading it And I was writing it and I was like, okay, I can see exactly where these things are. Yeah. Some of the, like some of the, the, we would call them crack AUs uh, back in the day on live journal. Like some of those AUs that April was writing was very much in that time frame of like the random, (laughs) 
the most random AUs you've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> like, there was one fandom, uh, I was in Stargate Atlantis fandom, okay. which I mean, there, there's actually been quite a few authors that have come from that same era. Yeah. Uh, that have actually, like, are major authors now. Yeah. But um, one of them was Naomi Novik, <laughs> and, like, she had a really big following in um, Stargate Atlantis fanfiction. Huh. I had no idea. Yeah. And so, but, like, you could tell the crack AUs, because I used to hang out with the crack AU people all the time. So my friend Suzanne, who was Scoozy fans, she, she would write things like John and and McKay as penguins for no reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, like, one time, like, in, in that same, I think it was, like, that same fic or another fic, like, like, McKay turned into a pancake randomly for some reason. So, like, but, like, when she's talking about these AUs, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going back in time and remembering things I had forgotten about. Okay, so I'm going to totally embarrass myself now. But in middle school, I used to write ER fan fiction uh, with a friend of mine. And it was the most goofy, like... It was the most goofy, maudlin thing you could possibly imagine. But at the same time, it gave me experience writing, right? And it was a way to get feedback on my writing. And my friend had these ideas for stories, but not the words to put them together. And so, uh, yeah, that was kind of what got me into writing my first novel, which I wrote in middle school. Um, Because I had amazing teachers who were like, yeah, we'll give you time in class. Let's do that. And uh, it was this, you know, awful alternate universe thing where it was called Rebellion Against the System, if that gives you any indication of what kind of a beautiful middle school ode to, you know, hormones this was. Uh, but, uh, but, but it got me writing and it didn't matter, right? Because right. it was one of those things. No one's going to see it. And no one's going to know it was me. But but I can do this thing and I can express myself and we all need outlets to express ourselves, yes. you know, that's and, a healthy thing. And it's something you should, it's like, you shouldn't be ashamed of being who you are. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously there are some caveats to that, but we don't really need to talk about them because it's obvious. Yeah. But like, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're doing no harm, then there's no reason to be ashamed. Yeah, exactly. Like, and that's... It, it, I don't know, like, that's that's one thing I really liked about the book was, you know, that that ability for her to be herself came after making the decision to put herself first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that change of job and change of scenery and, you know, change of demands, I think, really helped her release a lot of that stuff with her parents, too. Mm-hmm. Because essentially her job had been just like working at living with her parents. Yeah. You had to fit a mold. If you didn't fit the mold, you were gone. Right. And even with Marcus, too, we saw him go on this journey to decide how much of himself he wanted to disclose. And I think that is a really interesting arc um, to have someone go on, especially someone in the public eye. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, who who's being critiqued and who's being watched by people. And, you know, we all we all set those limits on ourselves sometimes. And it's so it was so interesting to me that here is this heroine who's saying, no, this is who I am. And I want to be I want everyone to know that this mm-hmm. is who I am. And I want to disclose all these different parts of me. And here he is thinking about how much he'd like to he'd like to do that too, you know, and how much he'd like to be able to tell everyone that, that he's a fan. Uh, so yeah, that was, it was really interesting kind of counterpoint between them. And I thought it was a really interesting too, because like when all the reveals happen Mm -hmm. and the different ways that they do, I thought it was interesting. The fact that like, you could see the relief Mm -hmm. in both of them. Yeah. Like she was scared to death to put that picture on Twitter and, you know, announce who she was. And the fact that, you know, she wasn't like 
a size two example of, you know, detailed, accurate. Mm -hmm. But she was still looking really well done and well put together and, mm -hmm. and proud of her work. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting because she was kind of shining a light on her, but she still hadn't fully shown all the lights that she needed to about herself. Yeah. To herself. Yeah. Like, she had shown the world what, what she thought she was, but there was still a little bit more to discover, and I liked that. She wasn't yeah. fully formed. She still had a little bit of work to do. Which is something we all go through in, in life. Yeah. And it's hardest to disclose ourselves to the people we care about the most, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the people we don't want to disappoint. And like you said, she didn't really have a relationship with Marcus yet, so she was willing to break that off. But then Mom keeps making these comments, you mm -hmm. know? And I think one kind of feeds into the other in a really real way. Like, when we have those relationships that drain a lot out of us, then we don't have energy for other things. Like, we don't... Yes. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't have any patience for the people who are telling us that they want us to come over and work out because we've got this, this anchor of a relationship that is taking everything we've got to hold it together. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Marcus too, it was interesting how he was so sorry all the time and so apologetic all the time and, and his self-esteem was so bad and you just, you just hurt for the guy, you know, yeah. and and you know where that's coming from. That's coming from his his parents, his relationship with his family. Um, so yeah, and then I, the leaders of his shows who are actually turning out to be more like his parents. Yes, exactly, and a and very loop. accusatory. Yeah, it, totally a feedback loop. Um, he's got this really good friendship, you know, over here on the side that's real supportive and stuff, but <laughs> a little unpredictable in its own way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I love that they watched Great British Bake Off together. Can I just say, mm -hmm. I thought that was adorable. That warmed my heart. <laughs> well, and I, and I like the fact, like, I liked the um the cast group chat too because you learned a lot about the people. Yeah, you know, like you like you could definitely see where, like, you could see that, like, um in in the um acknowledgments and stuff. Uh, Olivia talks about how um you know she was deep into the Game of Thrones and stuff like that. And, and yeah. everyone saw Game of Thrones with this show, and I'm like, did you people miss Xena? Because yeah. to me, it meant more like Xena. <laughs> oh, Xena. And I haven't thought about Xena in a long time. But, like, I was reading it, and I was like, like, it was set in Greece, ancient Greece. There was all these, <laughs> like, things. Yep. And, you know, then they talk about how it was transported to something else, but whatever. But, which, again, was Xena. So yeah. <laughs> nothing different there. <laughs> but like you know, I was just thinking about it, and I was like, to me, this is this seemed a lot more like Xena in many ways. Yeah. Um, and uh, like I put like a, I think I, my notes were like Xena and Rome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like if they had a love child, it would be like the show in the early seasons, I guess. Yeah. But um, you know, I, I was reading it, and I was like, I can see where this would be damaging to him. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, the the advantage for the for the Xena cast was was back then the internet was big, but nothing like it is now. Yeah, like it was nowhere near. Like you didn't have eighteen kinds of social media to have to check all the time to to have a keeper on you to make sure that everything was going right. Yeah, like you didn't need a Lauren. Yeah, right. Like you mm -hmm. you didn't need that kind of keeper, and so it, it was very interesting to me to see how how they all kind of like. We're getting more and more disgusted with this show, which, yeah, more power to him. I don't blame him. Yeah, I remember those cast conversations. I never watched Game of Thrones, but I remember the the conversations <laughs> that the actors had. The, the I can't say anything, but do you see this face? Yeah, <laughs> you know it was, it was very like Marvel universe <laughs> in that way too. And, and that so, would be so demoralizing, right? To pour yourself yeah. into this when you really have no creative control over it. And he's doubting his own take on it in some ways. But in another way, he's standing up for himself and saying, no, I think my take is better. You know? And and being able to have that confidence in his own intelligence and his own capability to read, you know, to, and, to, and to write and to create. 
Yeah. But and and you know like um mentioning that his like his dyslexia mm -hmm. was obviously was obviously a severe case. Yes. And it was an untreated case that his parents I think willfully ignored. They must have if she's a teacher. Like right. I was I was ready to throw my phone when I heard that. I was so mad that if she's a teacher that she would ignore it like this. Like that was it, really upsetting. And it makes you also wonder how many other students is she ignoring who have these problems yeah. and is labeling them as something less than. Well, but I'll say there is a thing with your own kids that like you can see the signs of something sometimes and be like, no, I, that can't be, you know, and, like not my kid, you know, right. kind of a feeling like that's okay for other kids, but not my kid. And it is a painful thing to, to have to look at those things and say, well, yeah, maybe my kid, you know, even though I've done the best for him as I can, I, you know, his teachers have done the best for him, but it wasn't enough. Um, so in one way I understood it. And another way I just was like, no, be a professional, be a professional and say, yeah, my kid has a learning disability. So, you know, let's, right. let's just face facts and deal with it instead of making him feel like a failure all the time. Well, see, and, and that's what made me think that she was ignoring any other students that she had had the same problem. Yeah. Because she was so, she was so into her, her cerebral superiority. Mm -hmm. Like it was, you had to be a certain way or you didn't count. And I wonder how many people she had that didn't count. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I don't think he I was do. the only one. I think he was probably the most severe case because she went home with him. Right. And then she didn't leave because she was at home with him. Right. But so I, I get the feeling him. that the mom was like very, you could only be a certain way and there's only one way to be smart, which is such bullshit. Oh Yeah. Because, totally. like, there are so many different ways to be intelligent. Yeah. My husband didn't graduate high school for mm -hmm. a number of reasons, or their version of high school here. But mm -hmm. the one thing he does is he can do, like, he does Photoshop really well. He's self-taught. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, he can, he can make, like, custom figurines self-taught. Mm -hmm. Like, his creative energy is his intelligence. And... Yeah. And and that's very much like Marcus. Marcus, this is his intelligence comes from his creativity, because of who he can be in that moment and how confident he can feel. Well, and neurodiverse people, the ones I've interacted with, the ones in my life, they come up with the most creative solutions to problems that I have ever found. Like they don't put the same kind of boundaries on themselves that that, that those of us who are neurotypical do. They're like, right. well, let's just do it this other way. And I'm like, that would never have occurred to me in a million years. And that is genius. Like, exactly. like they always come up with these awesome solutions. So yeah. And I thought, I thought that was great that she would put in somebody who was neurodiverse. Yeah. And the thing is, is it, and it didn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't something that had, that he, that he had to be saved from or fixed from exactly right? mm -hmm. like it, it had nothing to do with that it was yeah. all about okay i had to find the solutions i found a way around it now i can rock like yep. now i am super confident what i can do and i've read the same like the same things that my parents were screaming at me about reading that i couldn't read then i've read now and i can create something from that but you would not believe i i got some reviews i I wrote a dyslexic doctor uh, in my Timber Falls series, and I got yeah. reviews of people saying, oh, people with dyslexia can't be doctors. And I was like, um, they, they definitely can. Like, that's, I'm sorry, what? Like, I, just, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I actually went on the internet and I was like, dyslexic doctor YouTube, and like all these different things came up. <laughs> You know, and I was like, okay, I've had my sanity check now. I'm not crazy. People with dyslexia no, can be doctors. But no, I mean, no there's gaslighting this, the author, yeah. Yeah, but there's this really strong prejudice against people with learning disabilities that's like, oh, well, yeah. you know, they can't, they can't accomplish that. Sure, they can. The character used podcasts. He used audiobooks. He used um, just all these different tools that we have now to say, no, I'm not going to let this hold me back. I want to be a doctor and I'm going to be a doctor. You know, yeah. so there's still so much prejudice out there against people who are neurodiverse. There's a lot of auditory 
things that we can help with that we wouldn't have had like 30 years ago. Yeah. Heck, we wouldn't have had them like 15 years ago because podcasts were not nearly as popular back then. Yeah. I think they were on, they were kind of like starting a bit, but they weren't nearly what they are now. It was kind of like, they were kind of like the, um, uh, like the, like servers (laughs) that Uh used to be like the old fandoms back then, you know? Yeah. But, but now that we have them, why would you not use them? Because they, there's so many great, like podcast that's why the in the um best of 2020 i i have like people sending in their favorite books yeah but i also had like different episodes of different shows that i enjoyed that said something smart yeah and i don't mean like you know academic but i mean smart as in something that made me think yeah and i i found one that was like Ancient Greece Declassified, which is a podcast. Cool. Um, right now, he's not the host is not doing as much because pandemic plus new baby. Yeah. <laughs> so not a lot of time. Yeah. But you know, he had one earlier this year where he had a um, professor in a Seattle uh, college talking about Penelope weaving in the Odyssey and how that broke so many molds and what that yeah. did. Yeah. And, and you're like, and she also talked about like weaving in general. The professor talked about like the weaving and what that really was, and and how that functioned in the society and stuff. And I'm like, well, why couldn't someone like Marcus find something like that? That would that yeah. would explain so many things because these people are researching it. Why wouldn't he not find the experts <laughs> to find out what they were saying? Yeah, like he but doesn't I have still... to call them up anymore and ask, hey, what's this going on? He can literally go search this this person's name and probably come up with like. 14 podcasts they've been on to to talk about what they know yeah exactly which is exactly what the doctors can do and things like that you know when you're a doctor and say you're like studying um uh immunology and but you need to talk about something like you've got to study something that's like in maybe you know about i don't know kidney cancer right because maybe there's a connection to a client to a customer or not customer client but like you know you can find out what's going on with the patient Yes. And so I, I don't know why anyone would think that anyone think that you couldn't find a solution online somehow. Well, or, and I, just, I mean, like, that's the whole point of Sawbones, basically, is to talk about right. the history of medicine. Right. And I just giggle when people are like, do you count audiobooks on your books you've read for the year? And I'm like, why wouldn't I? Like, I, it's still reading. And, right. and actually, you know, there's such a there's people are acting like audio is this hit hot new thing it's like well but oral history is you know one of the one of the basics of prehistoric history is oral history the stories that have been passed down that help us understand things so you're really tapping into an ancient tradition that people have been using for you know thousands and thousands of years and i think it's i think it's great that you're tapping into it but let's not act like this is something new you know like let's Let's well, let's realize like, the tradition that this comes from. <laughs> well, and also like people, different people, they process differently. Like my yes. husband, it's harder for him to read. Like he just yep. doesn't have the the patience for it. Like, yep. I mean, we blew through the Christmas book and and blew it apart. But like he he read it fast because he wanted to be done with it. Yeah, and we had to podcast. But like you know, normally it takes him quite a while. But yeah. he can listen to something on audio on his way to work, bicycling to work and bicycling back and going to all the grocery stores and, and doing all that kind of stuff. And he can listen in that time because he can, yeah. you know, one and a half, two times it and hear everything quickly and yeah. process it. And, you know, it works for him. So why wouldn't I count that as reading a book? Right. Because we actually read um, Eva Lee's Temptations of a Wallflower through an audio book. Nice. I, I don't normally listen to audiobooks. For me, I, it's, it's better for me to be able to see it on screen rather than hear it because I miss things when I listen. Yeah. But, you know, my way is not everybody's way. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. how you read is however you're processing the stories that are around you. And that's Whether the thing, that's right? by, it's... you know, reading on paper, reading Braille, listening to it, you know, watching it. Like, however you need it to be done – yeah, like at, at, on all my classes as reading specialist, the, the question is: Is the reader interacting with the text? 
Like, is there stuff happening in their head that wouldn't have been happening otherwise? Do they have a movie going in their head? You know, do they, you know, are they making connections to their real life and to other texts? Like, that's what we care about when it comes to reading. Not, you know, not how are you putting it in your head, but how are you interacting with it? And audiobooks absolutely meet that standard. So I think that the bias against them is silly. So it's, it's classist. Yeah. And I don't like it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, like I said, audiobooks, not my thing for the most part. Like, I mean, I've, I've listened to a couple. Um, I listened to one the other other day. I have to write a review for Patreon because it's like a Patreon. I try and like do reviews for the Patreon Uh and um, exclusive. And so I, I need to write about it because I couldn't read it. Like I had read it, but I couldn't read it again Yeah, because it it was not my cuppa. But yeah. I saw it on, you know, where I could listen to the audiobook of it, and the narrators, whoever they were, were amazing. Yeah. Like I, w- I would listen to them again because mm-hmm. they were get- they were hitting the right level of of interaction that I needed with the yeah. text. Yeah. And so I don't understand why other people would not feel the same when they're literally processing the books. Because I guarantee you, they're not all reading Pride and Prejudice, but they're probably watching all the movies. Yeah. <laughs> Which has the highlights of the book, because I don't... I'm one of the few people on the planet that does not like Jane Austen, I think. <laughs> I just can't do her. I tried. I was, to read her for, I, I, I was supposed to read her for, like, a, for my women's lit class in college, and I was like, nope. I took my teacher, I was like, I'm not reading. I'm not reading, Emma. Thank you, anyway. She looked at me, I was like, I know, I write about women all the time. I'm not reading Jane Austen. I haven't liked her since I was 12. My I've dirty romance. More than once. My dirty romance secret is that I don't like historical romances. I don't really like historical fiction of any kind. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know, it's scandalous. I, I do is. what I can. I do what I can. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if I do read a historical fiction book of any kind, it better be like award-winning best in the universe style like i just read uh christmas gone perfectly wrong which was historical but it was good and it was short so that made it easier for me but i don't know just all the rigmarole about propriety and the way they dress and whatever i just like i just have no patience for it (laughs) but see that's how i am with like the a lot of the like contemporary like I, i don't read like a ton of contemporary yeah, I can't. I, I can't do like the billionaires or the bosses or like yeah. office romances. I can't do any of those. Like it, just, <laughs> it does not. It doesn't play in my head. All I see is static. Yeah. So I I can't get into it, and it, that kind of again, that's another thing that kind of makes me stand out because when we're talking about BookTube, you know, th- those are a lot of the ones that are recommended. Yeah. And I'm just like, I also don't read erotic. Yeah. Like, I don't read erotic romance, I don't read erotica, I don't, like, I don't read a lot of sex. So, yeah. the rare times that I do, mm-hmm. <laughs> it better be the best thing ever come out of the world. Yeah. <laughs> However it came out of the world. Yeah. Um, Because it's just, like, it's it's not something that, that I can, it doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. So, you know, that means, that, like, dark romances, which are, you know, Twitter loves to talk about I I can't li- I can't read them they don't yeah. do anything for me except make me feel uncomfortable yeah it's it's beyond my limit and so you know when when people say things about like about things not counting it it upsets me because even though I don't like those things I still count them for other people yeah just because they don't count for me doesn't mean they don't count for someone else yeah. I was surprised the other day because I write sweet romance, so there's no sex in my books. Uh, But I put something out there about how, you know, Romance Landia always says there, they don't want to yuck somebody else's yum unless your yum is a book with no sex in it. You know, and then it feels like it's absolutely okay to say, you know, well, that's not a real romance, you know, or that's not a real, you know, that's not a real thing. Uh, Which is... Like, it's fine if other people don't want to read it. It doesn't bother me. I I read steamy and I read clean and... Well, I don't like the word clean, but you know what I mean. I read yeah, steamy I and I like, read closed door. Yeah. I was going to say, I like closed door better because clean is... There's like a negative connotation to the to the steamy. For event. sure. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it casts... It casts aspersions, we'll say, on the steamy. Yeah. 
<laughs> which is not at all how I feel. It's just not what I write. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting that the things that people say count or don't count because it's all opinions, right? It's all, it's all just <laughs> us I mean, making like, it up as we go along. <laughs> when I write, like, I don't write very often, but when I write, because um, Mika has read it, but when I, when I write, I typically write more... I call it foreplay, but it's like foreplay to foreplay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, I really like that. Like, when I write, that's that's as far as I go because I don't, I don't necessarily have to write about sex or read about sex. Yeah. But if I do read it in the books, because I do yeah. read them, uh, I skim them a lot because yeah. I can catch the the idea of the connection and the emotional what they're going through you mm -hmm. know and so but that's one thing like in in like spoiler alert that was one thing that i really appreciated was i wanted to read those scenes because those scenes were actually like important to understanding april exactly like like it wasn't just like it, it wasn't just you know sexy times even though it obviously was yeah but it was also more like necessary yes absolutely necessary you know it it was absolutely like if you didn't read that you wouldn't understand how she felt and, and how mean, she felt seen and so it felt a little bit weird not to read it i mean because ideally, you were kind of erasing her that way yeah for sure and, and i and i think ideally all sex scenes would reveal something about the characters that you can't find out any other way you know right, what i mean exactly. like all of them would contribute to their character arcs and whatever and we obviously know that's not the case <laughs> yes but but i mean i think my favorite sex scenes and the best sex scenes bear not only their bodies but bear their hearts right yes. like bear their souls and you get to see that different level of intimacy not just with their bodies but but with who they are deep inside so that that vulnerability is what i look for yeah and i'm not trying to like you know <laughs> cast out any author that does put in there because I like I said I do read them I just skim them but yeah. you know for me it's not necessary it's yeah. it's not necessarily my speed yeah. but you know that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the art of of the writing yeah because but you know there are some writers that I love what they write I just can't read what they write yeah so, <laughs> but there are other ones that I can and it just, it all depends but and this one, I think it was absolutely necessary. Like I mentioned Mayday again. Um, and that one, the heroine loses her virginity. Mm. But the guy is drunk. Oh, boy. Exactly. So, you know, here she is. She's doing her birthday celebration, blah, 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 blah. And he's drunk. Mm. And it was like non-enjoyable. It was not fun, you know, oh. and... You know, it's a, that one's a second chance romance, which I, I actually enjoy second chance romances for a, a good portion of my, um, of my like not always reviewed writing and reading type stuff is like second chance. But um, yeah. in this one, I, I appreciated the fact that like, like in May Day, the sex was important to not just understanding April, but understanding April's past as well. Mm hmm because yeah. you could see exactly what she was talking about when she talked about those dates and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was important. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I, I need to read these. And the writing was hot. Like that scene in the park against yeah. the fence yeah. was like <laughs> flame worthy. Like I was, re I read that one aloud to my husband. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, Seriously, I read this book aloud so many different times to my husband. I just start <laughs> laughing. I'd have to explain why, so I just read the scenes. Yeah, it was more awkward for me. I was listening to the audiobook while I was on a walk, and so I'm just <laughs> walking along, and all of a sudden I'm bursting out, you know, with, <laughs> with laughter, because it was really funny. She's got a gift for humor, for sure. She does. She writes a good rom-com. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, I mean, it wasn't all rom-com, but you could definitely see, like, the rom-com elements to this. Yeah. I, like, I, I gravitate toward that. I don't like something yeah. that's 100% fluff. I like 75% fluff and 25% real. 
like I well I know you don't read historical but like yeah. I like to read Tessa Dare for that same reason mm-hmm. like when I read historical I want to have a little bit of joy like not like mm-hmm. joy like obviously I'm enjoying it so there's that but like joy as in I want to be able to laugh about something I like I like yeah. to laugh about the scenes because yeah you know if you don't laugh the emotional scenes to me do not hold as much weight for sure because there's no seesaw there Mm-hmm. they're just flat <laughs> and i mean you look so at I classic like literature too like shakespeare always has clowns right in his tragedies Dogberry. because yeah you you need you need those grave diggers right like you mm-hmm. need the goofy in the middle of the hurt um and i thought she did that really well and like um she was describing alex uh, marcus's roommate and co-star mm-hmm. Or I guess former co-star at that point. Yeah. She, he was writing about, uh, she was writing about Alex. And like, the only thing I could think of was Alex. Was I was thinking he was Aries from Xena brought to life. Yeah. <laughs> like, he not was as a Kevin Smith brought to life, but Aries himself brought to life. I really want his romance with Lauren. I like, I'm like, I need it. I and it need comes out it. next, it comes out in 2021. Oh yay! It's the next one in the book. It's the next, <laughs> the, the next in the series. It's Alex it, and Lauren, and it goes to the same time frame that that this one did, but you know, concurrently. Oh, I, as an author, I hate writing concurrent books because I'm always sure I'm going to make a mistake, or if they run into each, like I can't let them run into each other like mm-hmm. too much. Like if I have two different couples happening in the same book, oh, it's it's killer. So kudos to her for writing concurrent books. It's it's not easy. It, it comes out in June. Awesome. And Yay. I know because I had the book and the book, I was reading the little bit. They have like a little um, preview in the book. Oh, really? Ooh, the audiobook didn't have that. Yeah. Rude. And it's, it's in, it was in there and I was like, oh, this is great. I love this. This is, this is amazing. Let's see if I can find. It's called Slow Burn. Okay. Well, summer t- 2021, so. Nice. I always say June because, well, that's summer. Yeah, that's, that's close enough to the word to me. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's when I when I go to bed at like eleven thirty, and it's still bright outside here. So yeah, like midnight around that time, it starts to get <laughs> dark. Yeah. And then it's bright again by like four thirty in the morning. <laughs> I so learned that this north. year. That was entertaining. Yeah. You're so far north. I am. I'm like, but the weird thing is, is I'm far north, but I have Atlanta's weather. It's very odd. <laughs> Except Atlanta got snow. and We still haven't got snow. I'm in Germany. Where the hell is the snow? It does feel like they owe you snow. They do, because last year we just had like the little like, like, like dusting of it, like nothing real snowy. And like we were supposed to have snow today. And then the weather changed magically. And I'm like, you know what? I don't I don't believe in snow anymore, guys. <laughs> There's no such thing as snow. Snow is just something that doesn't exist. <laughs> just so you know. Yeah, good to know. The, the <laughs> snow that everyone else is seeing, it's not real. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's a figment of your imagination. It's it like must... that ride at Disney World. Yep. <laughs> which well, not everybody will get, but there used to be a little guy called Figment. Oh, really? And he used oh. to be on the imagination ride, so... <laughs> I used to love that thing. It was a little dragon. It was a little purple dragon. I was down with it. Yeah. It was purple and a dragon. Keyed me right in as a kid. Um, but, you know, it's... One thing I really like about this book also is the way Olivia expressed fandom from a woman's point of view. Mm-hmm. Because if you notice most, not all, but most of them were, you know, female fans and and women who she knew and so forth and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's important. Yeah, it is important. And it was it was a very different take on fandom than we usually see. Usually we see, you know, guys dressing up and going to the cons and ready you player know, one. Y- exactly. Ready Player One style fandom, um, whereas this was, I don't want to say more sophisticated, but 
it in some ways more sophisticated because there was a lot of thought going into this fandom. Um, you look at how she, you know, she learned to sew to make her costume mm-hmm. and her costume came out, you know, amazing. And I, that was one of my favorite parts was when she revealed her costume. Yeah. Um, but I just, yeah, I agree. It was a different take on fandom and uh, a, a, a really refreshing take on fandom. It was the, it was basically, it was like the fandom community that I know mm-hmm. because I know a lot of cosplayers. Um, again, mm-hmm. I grew up in Atlanta, so yeah. Dragon Con is there. Yeah. Kind of a big convention. Yeah. Um, and so I, I grew up with those, those ideas. I didn't start going until like 2008. I went from like 2008 to 2015, I think, but anyway. Yeah. Um, but you know, I got, I gained a lot of friends in that community. You know, people I went to school with were, you know, um, cosplayers. I, I had friends that I made, I don't even know where I made some of them. Um, but like that, that was their world. So to me, I was walking into a world I'm comfortable in Mm -hmm. because of that. And, you know, I, I did write fan fiction. I wrote like, I mostly wrote gen fan fiction. So it was like, you know, when I was writing SGA, it was like, um, Elizabeth Weir or Taylor or, you know, the, Mm -hmm. or, you know, Ford or, you know, the forgotten characters, basically the Mm -hmm. ones that kind of got shunted to the side for, you know, Mary Stu McKay. But like you, you saw it and it was very interesting to see how I had experienced it in a book. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I realize that my experiences are not normal for a lot of people because, you know, thank God I'm not a gamer, right? (laughs) Like, if I was, I would be so screwed. (laughs) I would be like, I I would be like Jim Sterling screaming at the TV every day. (laughs) So I get it. My husband loves him. So I watch, I watch a lot of things that I normally would not watch since I moved in with him. But um, it's a very interesting to see how again how the romance kind of like the romance community is kind of folded up in here because i have a couple of comments i'm like oh no this is directly at romance twitter yeah this is like directly (laughs) yeah like this is exactly what this means like and and i think that's important though yeah because it's an acknowledgement of the world she's in and also again she wrote and read fan fiction because it's in the author's notes in the book she actually talks about it and so it's interesting to see how olivia incorporated her experiences and the bonding that comes with that that yeah. comes not just from fan fiction but also from being a beta because i was i've betaed before um mm-hmm. it, it, you you build up this kind of relationship yeah and yeah. You know, and like she and, and like she did like talk about like comics and stuff like that because she talked about she made like a fridge reference and i, I made that note i was like it's a fridge reference i love it <laughs> Which for I like those it. that don't don't know what a fridging is, it's a Gail Simone thing. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say I like it when you find Easter eggs like that in a book where you're like, I know what you're talking about. Some people might be missing it, but not me. <laughs> yes, because like he said, like, and of course his wife's murder served as his motivation. Of course, and I was like, fridging. You you know the lingo, and that's I think that's another thing is like Olivia knew the lingo. She understood yeah. it. She was a part of it. It wasn't something she was just walking into for a payday. She was deeply involved in it. Yeah. It was obvious that it was close to her heart. And I just, I loved it. And I liked the little keys, like how she wrote, like she, like she even said spoiler alert more than once and stuff like that. So, yeah. which of course, not only spoiler alert, but also that reminded me of like um river from doctor who and stuff like that like the like there's layers of different fandoms built into this even if that wasn't her fandom yeah because fandom with a capital f at large is very um inclusive in our memes and stuff like that so Mm -hmm. so you got it yeah there was some scenes where i was like oh it's obviously like xena meets cleopatra and like cleopatra is in like the (laughs) the 1960s version the Elizabeth mm-hmm. Taylor version you know yeah. like you can see that kind of stuff yeah and it's it's just really nice to to see that yeah and you know like the gods of Gates fandom and the 
the con gate and stuff like that, I was like, this is someone that has seen a lot of Comic-Con in her life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she didn't just go on YouTube and, like, find the panels, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, she's, she, she's, she's like, been there. <laughs> yeah, she's been there, whether it be, you know, Comic-Con or any of the other, like, Emerald Con, whatever. Like, she's obviously been to ones. Yeah. You know, like, again... Dragon Con, so I I went to a lot of them, and I was just, like, very impressed with that. Yeah. And, like I said, with the cosplay, like, she obviously understood the the depth of a cosplayer. Mm Mm-hmm. Because there are... There are a lot of insecure cosplayers in this world because they don't match exactly the source, and they know they're going to get comments. Mm. Like, social media can be a blessing and a curse. Yes. Whether that's social media on YouTube, Twitter, Discord, you know, Twitch, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, obviously that, Twitter. I mean, Facebook. she showed she showed so well in the book how social media, at the same time, it, it helps us find our people, right? But it doesn't yes. necessarily keep the haters out. And it, you know, when you open yourself up to your people, you're also opening yourself up to people who aren't going to get it and yes. um, are going to come in with, with hate about it. So yeah, the internet's definitely a complicated place, but I do think romance Twitter uh, has really helped me to feel more connected to people who like what I like, you know, yes. and and who want to dish. <laughs> I mean, look yes. at us here, dishing about romance novels. <laughs> yes. It's, and like, it's and just... It's, it's just, amazing. It is. It's a great connection tool, but it's also hazardous. Yeah. And I thought she portrayed that really well. The, the genuine fear of what are people going to think if they if I put my real self on the internet. So And, like, and the fact, like, so what I loved about April was her confidence. Mm-hmm. Like, I loved her confidence yeah. when it came to, like, posting her picture online. She didn't care about the trolls. Who yeah. cared about them? Yeah. But what mattered was what were the people on the the server going to think? What are the people that she considered to be friends yep. or close to friends going to think? Yep. And I think that's something we all worry about. Like, there are reasons why I don't show my face or I don't show my parts of my face and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I have my own insecurities. Like, as confident as I am, I get it. You're just like... Because I don't... Again, I don't care what the trolls think. Yeah. Screw the trolls, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that. there's a block button for a reason. Yep. But it's the people that I communicate with, the people that I have built some kind of relationship with that I worry about. Yeah. Because their opinion matters to me because they matter on some level to me. Right. You know, like... I mentioned Courtney earlier and Courtney and I have become friends, Mm -hmm. but you know, we weren't friends before she appeared on March in March when, well, she appeared in March and then some things happened and or April anyway. And so some things happened and anyway, so she came in July and between like, you know, during that time she became my friend Yeah. and I wouldn't have had her for a friend if it wasn't for the podcasting community. Yeah. And and part of that podcasting community is like romance podcast for me mm-hmm. because I retweet a lot of them. I talk to a lot of them. Like there are, you know, ones I've watched grow and I'm happy for them. And I also know that there was a downside to that, which comes mm-hmm. with, you know, when Marcus talked about like not getting enough, getting the same number of likes because he didn't have pegging in his in his romance. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. Because, like, I, I worry about that, too. Like, you measure yourself whether you mean to or not. I measure myself harshly all the time with this podcast. Yeah. Like, that's why I'm constantly asking people, to, you know, hey, can can you give me some feedback? Stuff like, mm-hmm. because I want to make sure it's the right. I want to make sure it's something that people want to listen to. I want to make sure it's right. And I understood what he was talking about, that, that fear of if he outs himself in these roles, what is it going to do? Well, and it's the difference between critique and criticism, Mm -hmm. right? Because critique is welcomed. You know, if if we're healthy about our art, we want critique. We want to know how to make our art better and work on our craft. 
But criticism doesn't have the same end in mind, right? And right. so we have to be careful, I think, who we let critique our work. Um, yes. And I almost wonder if that's why it was so painful for her when she finds out uh, that it's been him she's been communicating with uh, because she she let him into that critique circle. You yes. know what I mean? She let him into that inner circle of, yes, you've looked at my work when it's not polished yet. Yes, you've helped me to hone this and this is a part of me. Um, yep. And so then to find out that that, that was him, that, that would be painful. And like when you when you become like when you get a critique partner because again I I've had betas and and stuff like that and when I was writing my fan fiction I had a couple and you have to trust them to give you honest feedback mm-hmm. without it hurting you yep in the same way because criticism is brutal mm-hmm. if it's not made in good faith yeah you trust your critique partners to give you good faith yes so when you steal that away and when you hurt and when you when you lie by omission or you lie in earnest or whatever lie is a lie in those situations it it breaks your faith in your own ability to know if someone is trustworthy and that's something so hard to get back to yourself yeah that's so and i think that that olivia did a really good job of focusing on that Mm-hmm. And showing how it rattled April. I thought she was going to kick him out of the car. I thought Me she too. was going to leave him there. And I was really concerned about it, honestly. I was like, please I was like, don't, how are you please getting don't home? strand him there. <laughs> uh, my thing was, was how was she going to get home? Because she was already in tears from her parents. So I, I like, know. How are you going to get home? Like, are you going to call your friends to come pick you up? I guess she was like, okay. Yeah. Pragmatically, I need to go home. I can't drive right now. But you're right. She she, can. she she had lost that confidence in her own judgment, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what friendships can do to us sometimes is they can rattle our faith in our own our own sense of what's true. I know that like okay, so I was briefly in comics for like 6 7 months whatever. Um I tried like Again, I I love Gail Simone, so that's why I went in. Yeah. Because I loved her Birds of Prey and her Secret Six, and I was you know I was deep into to her work, and then I found a few other people along the way. But in general, I didn't like comics. But I had made friends on boards. Um, uh-huh. Some of the fans are still my friends now, and others I let in, and they betrayed that trust. And then I was like, yeah. okay. And then they gaslit me and made me think it was my fault. But anyway. Right. So, but then I let them back in because it had been a while and I had like, you know, shored myself a little bit and then it was the same thing again. Mm. So I understood where, where April was coming from on that level too. Of like, how do you trust a person that has shattered your trust, not only in yourself, but people that you were sure was, were yours. Like they yes. were your people. That was your family. That was your because she didn't have a family like her mom yeah. and her dad were not her family yeah they they were a part of it but like her family was her friends online mm-hmm. and that i know really well because that's mostly where a lot of my friends were for a very long time because of many different reasons but so i understood her her shattered faith because now she's like well you know are the people on the server gonna like me for me now or because i'm dating marcus Mm-hmm. Like, and then it's like, well, what happens if I break up with Marcus? Mm-hmm. Like, I, do I tell these people who are now elevated higher than he was, but he was still my best friend and he betrayed me multiple times within like a few months. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I understood it so well. Mm-hmm. It, it felt really real for anyone that's had online friendships turn out to be something that they weren't yeah for sure and especially if it's like if it's a um for me it's opposite sex for it but if it's like you know someone that you're um attracted to and would Mm -hmm. like to have something with but maybe Mm -hmm. it won't turn out that way yeah so you're already nervous to begin with 
Yeah. Because she was, because she was like, I'll, I'll dump Marcus. You know, she was, he, she was going to dump him, but he she didn't know that. She's like, I was going to dump Marcus, and you know, if, if you want to give me the time of day, he's second place to you. I don't know what you look like, but you're first in, in line because I trust you so, so definitively and so deeply and so, truly, mm-hmm. that your opinion matters more than anybody else's in the world. Yeah. And stripping that away from her was cruel. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was a cruel to be kind act in his mind, but it was yeah. still cruel. Right. Because I, he was looking at it from his perspective, but I don't think he was looking at how deeply it was for her. Yeah. Well, and, and he I, had a very black and white thing about it, right? Well, I can't, mm-hmm. I can't reveal this about myself ever. And anyone who's ever had a big secret like that knows how scary that is, right? Yeah. Like, I can't reveal this about myself ever. Therefore, I can't tell her, you know. Right. And and it just wasn't even a question in his mind. I don't think. Um, My husband, when I first met him, was very black and white and thinking, and I've had to teach him about grays. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's not always easy, and I have a feeling that April's gonna have. A- have a long job in the future of doing that. Yeah. It it, ta- it takes a lot of work to teach people who have been taught that there is only black and white, right? Like, yeah. And like for my husband with his, you know, neuro- neurodiverse thinking, he doesn't see the gray necessarily. I have to point it out, mm-hmm. which can cause conflicts. Yep. And I can definitely see in their future them having those kind of conflicts. Because, you know, she's very, she's very explicit, but she's not always explicit. And she's going to need him to be able to catch that. No, she does hint. Like, yeah. she does, she does kind of dance around the topic sometimes. So yeah. it, it did feel like that was part of the growth that she underwent was being able to just say it, you yes. know, and be able to just put it out there what the real issue is that's happening Instead of, you know, kind of dancing around it. Yeah. And and I think that's exactly it. And they both had to learn to be more honest in their comment. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say they weren't honest, but honest to themselves. Yeah. Like, they were honest to each other all day long, but honesty to themselves was something else entirely different. Yeah. That's really true. And I think that that, again, like... Olivia wrote things that I have never felt so seen since I read this book. Mm -hmm. Like I I've been seen in a couple of other books. Like I saw myself in Portia and a Duke by default Mm -hmm. with her ADHD and stuff like that. I totally saw her and myself Mm -hmm. in that. Love that. Um, I saw it also in Alyssa Cole's let it shine. Mm -hmm. Alyssa Cole seems to write me a lot, even though I don't know how she does, but (laughs) I never met her before she wrote it. But you know, Olivia specifically, felt like she saw me and I, th- I think a part a big part of it was the fact that like April's fat like mm-hmm. she doesn't dance around it she doesn't hide it she doesn't like you know wear slimming stuff all the time she doesn't like she's okay with it yeah um but also I think that she also saw the the vulnerability that comes with that because you have to be you have to be sharp about everything else around you in order to protect yourself from the nonstop criticisms for being alive. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that she did a good job of, of doing that. And also in that same time frame, she taught Marcus how to be more aware Mm -hmm. because he, I mean, because he was very aware to begin with. That's why he was learning as much as he could. He was thanking the crew. He was doing all that stuff, but I don't think he was aware of, you know, we'll see in person versus we'll see online. Mm -hmm. And he had to learn how to put those two together. Mm -hmm. Anyone that's ever had an online relationship will know that like an online romantic relationship will know that because in my mind, they had one online. They just didn't say it. Right. Oh, they totally did. Like they, if nothing else, they were having a pretty consistent flirtation for a few years. Yeah, for sure. But also the emotional support was there. 
Yeah. You know, and that's what the those intimacy. snippets. Yeah, exactly. That was what we kind of got to see through those snippets was them, you know, confessing their fears, confessing their their hopes, you know, and um, how much was being expressed through their stories that c- was difficult to express. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think there was definitely a, a real relationship there happening already. It was, again, honest. Mm-hmm. You know, like when when you can take away all the in person stuff, I mm-hmm. think you're the most honest mm-hmm. because you can hide it. Like you can hide the stuff that you're not confident about, but you can also like um, how do I put this? Like you can also be your most bare. Mm-hmm. And I say this as someone who started her relationship online. So mm-hmm. you know, I met him through OK Cupid. Mm-hmm. I found one of the few good ones on OK Cupid. I was very surprised by this. Yeah. <laughs> Not all of them were from the people I was talking to. Yeah. <laughs> through many attempts on that website. But, you know, I was the most vulnerable. And it was early on, like her. Um, and, you know, I had a similar reaction of push away instead of explain. And mm-hmm. I had to come back. And we had to have long conversations about that. And, you know, once we did, we, we found our, we found our way. Mm-hmm. So I understood her, her vulnerability, but I also understood his vulnerability yeah. because not, I mean, not just the, the job thing, but also the vulnerability and not having to wear a mask mm-hmm. because he'd had to wear one his entire life. Yeah. He how, was trying how to you drop figure the mask out and be who you are. Exactly. His challenge was figuring out how to take off the mask. Mm. So, and like, I understood what he was doing with the routine with her father right away. Mm-hmm. Like I, number one, understood it. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. She didn't, but I did because I've done the same. Mm-hmm. Like, I will do whatever I need to do to protect the person I love. Like, I will. Like, th- there's been times where I've literally taken my my then fiance and I out of a situation and walked out Mm -hmm. because I didn't like how he was being treated. Yeah. And for Marcus, his instinct was to separate Mm -hmm. to, to make sure that there was no way that the person that was hurting the most could hurt her more without realizing what was going on. Yeah. Because he hadn't quite, listen to the dance enough to understand because they had just started dating. Right. So he didn't know the speech patterns to give that clue. Well, and he hadn't figured out where the threat was coming from yet. Mm. Right. Like to him being kind of rejected by the father was more painful than anything mom could say. He just didn't really see her yet. And it was just, it just takes time. Right. It takes time to see each other and it takes communication. And that was something that they had to work on. Exactly. And like, I think that as someone that's been in a relationship where let's be very clear, like parents can completely screw up a kid Mm -hmm. like in different ways. And whether they think they're doing the best they are or not, it can screw up a kid. Like it's, it's, part of life yeah <laughs> get this point like there's always going to be something that's going to leave a mark on a kid um but it's it's very clear that their their marks were similar but for different reasons mm-hmm. and their and their mark was not being enough yeah right like well obviously the mom got fat having april so no more kids there Mm-hmm. And, you know, well, obviously my kid's not going to be a Rhodes Scholar, so why try anymore? And what like does it really go? Gonna, I mean, for not the... Not have the social cash, the, the social, you know, the social um, uh, commodity that his right. parents wanted him to have. Right. I just saw so much fear at the heart of both those parents. 
right? Mm-hmm. The fear oh, that yeah. she's going to be rejected the way I was rejected. The fear that people are going to know my, you know, my colleagues are going to know my kid is stupid, you know? And mm-hmm. that fear, thankfully, didn't take root in their kids, you know? Yeah. And didn't, uh, they were able to yank that out and and say, nope, not going to live in fear. Uh, not going to let that control me the way it controlled my parents. And particularly the women. I thought that was interesting. Uh, in the book, both the moms were very yeah. fear, very fearful. I'm wondering if that was also a, a intentional thing for the generations of the moms. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, one mom was, you know, a scholar mm-hmm. in an era when, like, you know, women were barely getting their degrees. They were mostly getting that MRS degree. Mm-hmm. And the other one was, from what I gather, you know, brought up to be that MR, you know, MRS, like, you know, to mm-hmm. not be anything but that, to be nothing yeah. but a, a vessel for her husband's success. Yep. And... You know, it it felt a little personal too. Like it, it felt like something that the writer had experience in in some way. Mm. Because it didn't feel like it, it didn't feel like empathy for a person. It felt personal to me, and I understood that because mm. you know Olivia is slightly older than I am, but close enough. Yeah. And so I, I can see where the generational thing would be. Yeah. And so I, I just think it was very interesting. I do probably need to head on out soon. Um, Me too. <laughs> I don't know if you wanted to do the book recommendation. Yes. Okay. You give your best book recommendation. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's my best book recommendation, but... <laughs> A book that I felt like was tangential kind of to this book was Nora Ephron's book, I Feel Bad About My Neck, um, which, first of all, is an amazing title. Uh, <laughs> but second of all, I just felt like, in kind of the same way that Olivia Dade did, she touches on so many things about women's bodies that we don't usually talk about. And uh, just thinking about my own past, like... I don't know. She just, she just touched on so many things that I was feeling about my adult body that people didn't talk about in polite company. Uh, and I think about things I've learned even on Twitter about perimenopause, uh, and how it's a real thing and we don't talk about very much like how it works. And it seems like it's okay to talk about how women's bodies look, but not about how they work. Right. And Nora really broke that and was like, look, here's how it is. As you get older, this is what your body's doing. And and she's doing it in, you know, a memoir, humoristic way. But it was just great. It just made me feel so seen, kind of like you said. It made me feel so like, man, this is the kind of stuff I need to know. Uh, and she's such a great, great and funny writer. So uh, oh, I, I love Nora. <laughs> yeah, I know you. I know you wanted to do a, a podcast about her too. So yeah, I, I I definitely recommend that one. I could I could talk about like I think being a child like because I was born in the, the very early '80s, so I'm an upper millennial. Yeah, and I grew up with her movies being new. <laughs> yeah, because I saw when Harry met Sally when I was very young. Yeah, but I also saw it when I was older, and I. I understand and I appreciate where she's coming from because I can see it. I can see her visual cues Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, like her little things. And the one thing that I noticed is, is most of her heroines are like, you know, 29, 30. Mm -hmm. They're somewhere above like 25. Yeah. Yeah. Which was huge back when this was getting made. I'd never thought about that, but you're totally right. Right, like so, like, so there, there are people that are moving beyond the just graduated college and and handling things. Yeah, and I just I thought that was a really interesting way of examining women. Mm-hmm. And she like, writes about professional women. 
You know, yeah. she, she writes about women who have things going on in their life. Uh, Driven just like, women. Mm-hmm. And in her memoir, she talks a lot about New York and about the idea of home and fitting into a place. And I just love those themes as someone who's lived in two different countries. It's always interesting to me to think about home and think about um, what makes somebody belong. Like, what yeah. makes somebody feel like they're a part of something. So... I I can definitely go with that. Yeah. <laughs> Especially after moving. Cuz like yeah. the first time I the first time I went on really vacation outside of the country besides when I was 8 was when I moved. Yeah. It's a huge adjustment. Oh, it is. It totally is. And so I I definitely will try and get that while I still have Kindle. Yeah, I've only got it for a month longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's And I'm it's pretty not... sure the German library doesn't have it because they don't have anything in my in my language, pretty much. Yeah. Um, I've looked in the Libby section. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it's Libby and Overdrive. I've looked at both of them, and neither one of them have anything for me for the most part. Yeah. But, you know, I can try and find some form of it here, maybe. Yeah. eBay is a thing still here, but. Yeah. Um, no, but I think it's a good, it's one I actually want to read because I think it'd be pretty interesting it, it's, it relates to what we were talking about anyway. Yeah. It's like, just totally know, along April's the same lines. In her thir- like, she's in her 30s. She's not yeah. 22. Yeah. There, there's a whole life in between there. And, you know, I, I like reading about women that are a little bit older and have experiences. I was raised by a godmom who was 48 years older than I was. <laughs> mm-hmm. So there's a lot of life I experienced through her that I probably wouldn't have, you know, yeah. if I'd had a younger godmama. And I just appreciate plots that aren't centered around, I don't know who I am yet, which I feel yeah. is what a lot of, like, early 20s new adult romances are. I really like reading about women who know who they are. Um, and I like that there's other sorts of conflict. Like, it's more mature. It's like, we need different things kind of a romance. And instead of, oh, you cheated on me or, oh, you, you know, yeah. you want to go to this college? Oh, no. You know, kind of a, yeah, exactly. it's less circumstantial in some ways. You know, it's more deeply emotional, I think. Um, once you get to a little bit more mature, with mature, more mature characters. And I think it's really interesting to have kids in romance, not everybody likes it, but I think it's really I interesting. Do it. I do. I love it. Yeah, I like to read them as long as they're not like precocious kids. I'm good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, I like real kids. I don't like you know perfect kids. Yeah, no, I, I hate perfect kids. G- give me kids throwing a tantrum in the store or something. That's <laughs> that's my jam. <laughs> there, there's a reason why I like that Sydney Penny movie about being a nanny and having those awful children. I like yeah. I liked that one. <laughs> yeah. That was a really good movie. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's called nanny something but yeah like but like I I like those kind of movies like I mean she was young but I liked the kids because the kids were not perfect yeah just like I don't want perfect main characters I don't want perfect kids either I want to I want to see them dealing with the the gritty stuff sometimes too with kids <laughs> exactly I like to see the reality yep for sure Okay, so where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. It's Fiona West Author. You can find me on my website, FionaWest.net. Uh, those are kind of the two places I, I hang out the most. And all my work is in Kindle Unlimited, so if people are looking for a free read, uh, I'd be honored if they picked it up. And if they remember really well, they'll know that I've already reviewed one of your books. Yeah, that's right. By the time this one goes live, that one will be live. Sweet. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, it was nice having you on, Fiona West. Yes, thank you. And I thank you for answering the call out. Oh, totally (laughs) my pleasure. This was a blast. Thank you so much for having me. I am very glad to know that because I want everyone to have fun. That's the whole point. (laughs) Yeah, it was totally fun. And to fan them out sometimes and geek out a little bit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you go take care of your kiddos. Yep. <laughs> I will go take care of my dog, who is apparently hacking up a lung, as always. 
<laughs> to be fair, she has chest issues, so this is not yeah. anything alarming. Yeah. She's got, like, a cap gun, like, a bullets in her, and one of her, like, lungs from... Aww. Anyway, long before we got her. So, we try and take her outside and let her go walk and get some fresh air. So, that's what she's coughing at the door for. She's like, excuse me, it's 9 o'clock, I gotta go pee. Yeah. <laughs> so, you go take care of the kids, I go take care of mine, and... I'll talk to you on Twitter, as always, because I'm sounds, always around. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks. Yep, thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, I'm Bex, also known as Potato Lady Podcast Reviews. Every weekday, I tweet out reviews of indie podcasts. My goal is to unite listeners with their next favorite show, like the one you're listening to now. I also have a newsletter that provides links to reviews, sneak peeks, ad space, and more. So follow me on Twitter at Bex Goose, that's B-E-X-G-O-O-S, to start getting week daily reviews. Find all the info you need, including the link to sign up for my newsletter, in the thread pinned to my profile. And feel free to get at me if you need a recommendation. And now, back to your show. Hi! I'm going to talk about Sword and Silk books a bit. Instead of putting in just a regular promo, I decided to give you a clue as to why it's cool to have this on here right now because it's the beginning of the year and you've obviously been listening about April being a total badass and a confident and even though she has her moments of insecurity, it's kind of cool and I think that's important because Sword and Silk Books is a very small traditional company. It's like Violet Gaze Press, which has you know, been gaining a little bit more name and and notoriety within like the twitter sphere and stuff and so i like that sword and silks has the same idea of talking about all women in life and also how there are badasses in different ways a lot of the focus seems to be on new adult and young adult but that doesn't necessarily mean that <laughs> we won't cover on a podcast right like I love those kind of books. I'm getting back into liking those kind of books. It's been a while. And so having a small company that likes to talk about women being, you know, in charge of their own fates, like that's the whole point of deconstructing damsels, right? Like in a nutshell, it is just what it is. And so I love that Lainey, who is a publisher, has put together this fabulous team of women who know what they want and what they want to read and they want to make that more center. And so I really hope you guys will go visit. You can find them at swordandsilksbooks.com and it was a GoFundMe that was raised and continued on. And I love them. They're very welcoming, <laughs> which is pretty cool in the romance community. It's always nice to have yet another small publisher as the bigger publishers are taken over. So if you would like to visit them, I highly recommend it. You can also find at Sword Silk Books on Twitter and Sword and Silk Books on Instagram. And in the world of book community, those are kind of a big area in discussions. And so I definitely want you guys to go visit. And I hope you guys can find something because small publishers are really important right now. So let's support them. All right. So we're almost done for the day. <laughs> I'm going back to my trusty phone. I almost got it my computer, but it might as well be that, right? It's got all my books and stuff on it. Well, not all of it, but most of it. And I talked about this in the beginning, but I really wanted to highlight something. I wanted to thank Infimuro Woman, who is Infimuro Girl, G-R-R-L. She listens to my podcast, and I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, but it kind of is, because this is not her genre. And, you know, she's learning things, and she's, you know, interacting, and she's finding things out from from things that I have talked about. And that's kind of amazing, because I was not expecting that. And, you know, it makes me feel heart happy. Because, like I said before, it, I I sometimes wonder if, if I'm not giving you guys enough content. You know, there I, I have limited amounts of <laughs> focus with my ADHD sometimes. So I'm trying my best to stay ahead of it this year. I'm trying to be a little bit better about it. But, you know, 
those kind of comments are very balming to me and I don't know if I can explain how much so. And I, like I said, I wanted to call her out explicitly because that's what made me kind of open my eyes a bit this year and see how many other people have been talking about me that I hadn't noticed and that my assumptions of being an imposter are not silly because it's just part of life, but not valid. And so I want to thank so much for that. And I also want to thank Chris Alice at The Romance Voice, which is not a podcast. It is a newsletter that she puts out. I want to thank her because there aren't that many romance community members that speak English, I should say, in Germany. And like she's the only other person I've met. And I wanted to give her a shout out for that reason. Now, <laughs> on to something you guys are going to be especially happy about. The next episode will drop on Valentine's Day, and you know what that means. That's the annual episode with Finn and I talking about something. And this year, I have decided to go far, far, far outside the bounds of anything I've ever given him before. And we are reading an alien romance. (laughs) More like alien sex from what I can tell. He's like 25% of the way through it. We're reading it through my Kindle Unlimited access that, you know, I got when it was on sale earlier this year. Because it's very hard sometimes to get, like, English books here. And so it means a lot. And so it's (laughs) going to be great because... It's completely outside of his bounds. I mean, I haven't read that many alien romances before. I've listened to a lot of episodes about them, however, so I at least had a little bit of a knowledge before going in. Not so much for my husband. Oops. But (laughs) the episode will be appearing on Valentine's Day, and then the episode after that will be Go Deep by Real Z Adams, and that is with Adele Buck, who's book just dropped and it just dropped in like I think it was the 20 yeah January 26th and it's her debut so if you want to go pick it up it's actually the reason that we have a reading prompt called backstage hookup because she started talking about it and I went you know there's not that many of them usually it's got the star or something but usually not the behind the scenes people so I was like hmm that's a good prompt now I'm gonna take like maybe two minutes and talk a little bit about something before you go, I want to talk about the historical romance readathon. I did that. Like, I, it was a week long reading of historical romances. I got like 10 books out, and most of them were novellas. I found so many I love. I will link to the Twitter thread where I talk about them. I'm going to be reviewing some of them for Patreon, and I'm also going to be reviewing some for Instagram throughout the next month or so to give you kind of like a little drops of what I've been reading. I hope that you'll enjoy it. And I read a lot of new to me authors and, and some, well, some of them are not new, but the subjects were or whatever. So I hope you will catch up on that. I also want to say happy release to Seleka Schneider, whose Big Bad Wolf is a contemporary, but I'm mentioning her because there's something old school in the way she writes. And I don't mean that like badly. What I mean is there's something very like... I could see some of her books being like a 60s or 70s, like visually that style of a movie or whatever. And so I I wanted to talk about that, which is not historical either, but it kind of vaguely relates back because, you know, that's the height of the growth of romance as a popular genre and the, the bulk of it suddenly starting to eat up the market share. And so I want to talk about those two things and say woohoo. So thank you to Jessica. Lacey and Lisa for that. I kind of petered out on like day five, but I had a ball. I really enjoyed finding a couple of the books, like uh, A Death of Duke and Miss Mifford from Claudia Taylor was just amazing. It's like a Regency cozy. I'm going to be covering that later this year, and I'm going to have Angela Hart from Write a Heart, who does a lot of romantic comments and and pushes and she also does a lot of cozy mysteries if you listen to boobies and newbies which you should be doing anyway you'll know she was on the last set of boobies and newbies and i actually highlighted that in my best of 2020 episode so damselspodcast.com for that so thank you guys for listening 
please, if you really like these episodes, if you want to rate and review, I always forget to say this, but it really does help. Like, even above the whole ranking thing, it just lets me know what you guys want to hear and what you guys are enjoying, and it means a lot in that way. Rate and review, wherever that may be. I use Podchaser because Apple products and my computer do not get along. If you want to go to Apple, if you want to, like, just let me know. <laughs> like, if you want to at me, that'd be even better. I am available at Damsel's Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can email me at damselspodcast at gmail.com. And, of course, you can find me at patreon.com slash damselspodcast, where there's going to be a little bit more content coming up this month has been kind of slow january was kind of slow but i just kind of got burned out a little bit but we have things we're going to be putting up soon because i have some reviews that will be going live and <laughs> i have ideas for february because that theme is oh yeah the theme for next month is lust month hence the alien sex and go deep so <laughs> we'll talk about lust and passion and all those in between I look forward to hearing from you, please, pretty please, cherry on top, please. Until then, <laughs> please have a really good day, a fine joy, even if that joy is getting rid of that dust bunny that's been there for six months. You know what? You cleaned up for the day. Go have a cookie. <laughs> Bye, guys.